I know that you'd rather run the risk of making 50. Now let me see how many hands in this room for the last three years have averaged $5 a head net profit on a hog. Look around, ladies and gentlemen, and look at all the hands up. Now, isn't that interesting? You wanted 50, you wouldn't take 10, and you didn't make 5. <laughs> you better think about it, ladies and gentlemen, because you see, your empty hip pocket is the result of that bad decision. That's sobering. I want it to be sobering. My job is not to be your comedian. My job is to put up a profitable program for you to use. There is no reason that every hog y'all have produced the last three years did not make a minimum of $10 net dollar return for you. Had you used Merle Sunken's forward contract program in hogs, there is no reason that they didn't except you chose not to because you and someone else decided the odds was you was going to make more, and you didn't do it. I'm not a good educator, and I'm certainly not a good diplomat, but we do in your livestock department know how to make you money if you will take and stay with a developed program. I've heard the paranoia, I've heard the reluctance, I've heard the comments about the mercantile, about futures trading. And I, I know that it's a volatile thing. And I know that very few, if any of you, should personally get into it. But I believe as director of the livestock department, and I believe Frank Kraft believes as director of the grain department, that we are in a new marketing and bargaining area. I think that the year of 1983 is going to weed out the weak sisters that are representing marketing and bargaining organizations. And I don't personally want to be one of those that get weeded out. I want you to be in a proud position of marketing through our ability to bargain for you. I want to emphasize what I'm talking about. I've been accused in your organization and my organization, Devon, <laughs> I've been accused of approaching the big boys. I've been accused of dealing and designing programs to benefit the big ones, not the little ones. I've been reminded that the guts of this organization 25 years ago was developed to help the small family operator. No one understands that better than I do. I understand it explicitly. You see, the reason we had to work for the last couple years on the larger operators was because we had to have the volume that was not, offer, uh, was not offered by the general participating membership. It's really that simple. Now, up till this coming Monday, we've not had a program for for instance, the little operator. Now, several of your national directors have asked me, Mel Mannernock specifically from Northeast Iowa, why in the world don't you develop a forward contract program for the little guy? Merle Sunken and his staff for the last, I suspect, two months have been working hard to develop that kind of a program. 
Now, a little operator on hogs would be 35 head or 7,500 pounds. And that a contract physically calls for 30,000 pounds to make a full blowed legal deliverable contract. So you see the difficulty to get someone to accept the accountability, for instance, is unbelievable. But here's what we've done in your behalf. At this moment, lying on Merle's desk in Corning is a signed contract by an entity that we have bargained with and have gotten a 7,500 pound contract for you. Now there's another plus to that. That contract is not with any specific packer. I'm saying that Merle's in a position, for instance, to sell a 7,500 pound unit of hogs in New York City or LA, California or Seattle, Washington or Miami, Florida and, and he doesn't have to worry about who gets them. That's the advantage of knowing what to do to help producers. I can't take credit for it so I can talk very objectively about it. Merle knew what needed to be done. Merle knew that that needed to be done and he went out and he suggested the possibilities of this type of forward contract to protect the little operator and he got it done for you. Now I assure you that the national farmers are the only organization in this nation that represents producers that have that contract. Now a year ago at the national convention we stressed forward contracting and at that time I think it may have been said that give it a while and everybody in town will have the same colored dog. And they do. The co-ops have got forward contracts, the feed companies got them, everybody but the ladies dress store has got a forward contract program today on livestock. But we started the forward contract program as we developed it ourselves. This is a new venture into forward contracting to protect the small producer. There are no excuses. The man with 35 head of Bookshire hogs today is just as protected through our forward contract program as the man with 10,000 head. I can tell you what will cause them not to become effective. That's lack of participation. You see, I don't have to understand Kalo to believe in him. I believe in the man and I respect his ability to protect me. I think what I'm saying, Frank and I ask for that same courtesy from you. You don't have to understand the intricate details of forward contracting as it relates to the national farmers. You don't need to if you believe in our ability to perform for you. I can assure you that we have the ability, but I can also guarantee you we have the programs. It's, very, it's, a, it's a real matter of pride for us to be able to stand here and offer you this, this option. It's not an option in any sense of a gamble. It's a guaranteed, locked in, no risk, no deposit, no margin call profitable return on your operation. You can't turn it down. It's that simple. If I ask Sunken tomorrow morning to quit using cash sales exclusively and start with absolutely nothing more than forward contracts, I expect 1,000% participation because it's a guaranteed locked in net dollar return to you as a producer. We can't even offer you that on case sale formulas on the annual contract. So why turn it down? You can't. I want to quit at this point. I think that if you're like me, many of you from the grain, as strictly grain producers, or as a combination of livestock and grain, I think you may have questions.
I know I do. I'm not going to express my ignorance, though. I'm going to ask him privately. <laughs> but I would rather ask a stupid question than make a stupid mistake. So I'm going to open this up for a while for questions and hopefully answers. Keep in mind, Kalo can't endorse anyone, any particular, any specific. He cannot do it. So don't ask for it. But if you have questions in relation to forward contracting, please ask us. If it deals with our program, ask us. Frank and I are here for that purpose. I went up on Frank. I asked my staff to come in because there's many of them questions they can answer and I can't. But we'll do our best. But I think you folks need to become aware that unless you change me as your employee, my direction, we are heading this way. We are going to forward contracting quick. We are going to lock in and guarantee ourselves profitable returns. In spite of how tough it is to take, make some of you take a profit, I want to do it. <laughs> With that, let's go for some questions and hopefully some good answers. We have a first hand, would you stand up and try to talk as loud as you can? The basis, Merle, on that 35-head contract, uh, I can answer you in part, Merle. If I don't complete it, you finish me up. You or Larry. Um, the basis will depend on whether it's a spot month, meaning that month on the Merck that's quoted, or a middle month, meaning that month on the Merck which is not. That will alter the basis because of the risk factor on middle months, uh, case coming close to delivery time and et cetera, there is a discount. It also varies by whether you're 10 months out in front or a nearby contract, for instance, as an example, February. Also, it varies by state on the spread. Now, Larry, you and Merle, we're in that heavy negotiation. Is there a better explanation than what I've given? To quote a spread, you want me to say it's two bucks off, it's five bucks off. Unless I knew your state, unless I know your spot month or your middle month, I can't. And comparable to what, sir? Merle says it's competitive and in cases better than anything we've ever had on any given month on the spreads. Will that help you, sir? All right. Over here. Okay, I, Merle, uh, you've put Merle in a bind, and I'll tell you why, and it wasn't, I'm sure, intentional on your part. You must understand there's different strokes for different folks. <laughs> this outfit you're referring to in Ohio very possibly is the outfit that we're dealing with. I can, uh, I can assure you that in relation to what they offered in Ohio, our volume potential makes a drastic difference in the way they presented their program to us compared to what they're presenting in Ohio. We had to grant a little professional courtesy and not go much further with that, but the first shipment of hogs you put through, I think you'll see the difference. 
that would be through our program. That's actually about as far as I can go with that because they're a, they're a company that deals with the smallest individual themselves and they deal with the largest themselves. But us in a collective nature represents more than all they deal with and they're willing to pay for that but they can't make it public. Okay. No, sir. It's beyond the organization. So our, in other words, for instance, the cattle, this presentation, this whole issue of futures isn't really going to change our position as an organization. Is that, that is exactly a fact. If you didn't hear his question, and it bears repeating, the national farmers as an organization are not in futures trading. We are not doing any more than we are designed to do, and that is sell product for a guaranteed, locked-in cash dollar return to this organization. I could not, I'm sure Devon would not, allow me or Frank to enter into any high-risk venture with your money to jeopardize our trust the reserves, and so forth in any high-risk ventures. This is 100% protected money, just as we currently are selling to credit-approved buyers anywhere on any of our product. Is that okay? It's a good thing you got Devon Woodland for president because if it had been up to, left up to me exclusively, we'd have been in there. <laughs> and I respect Devon's decision because it was right. If I'd have been right, I wouldn't be working for a living. A middle month is any month that is not physically quoted on the Chicago Mercantile as a trading month for that product. For instance, on a product, maybe you have a commodity that is quoted March, possibly is not quoted in April, possibly is quoted in May. Then April would be considered the middle month. And there's a discount in most forward contracts for the middle month because you make delivery in the middle month and the buyer has the risk of, and ladies, this is a industry term, you'll have to excuse me, the term is running naked until the spot month they've hedged in, which is the next month coming, or in this case would be May. And for that extra added risk, because they don't have the product to support them for those days between when it was delivered and when they can lift their contract, that high risk requires a maybe in livestock a 50 cent a hundred extra discount. Well, I think the answer is in what you said right there at the tail end, plus the fact that the rules have been changed an awful lot since that soybean problem and also since the silver problem. Uh, you know, sometimes we, you know, we're reactive uh, people. You know, we don't really sometimes uh, shut the barn door until the horse is gone. But at least uh, in those two instances, uh, the rules that have been adopted by the commission since then uh, appear to me to be the right rules or the right approach to the problem. Now to, to guarantee, you know, that the inventiveness of the human mind that's intent on mischief 
uh, can't work around rules, uh, you know, no place have they ever been able to guarantee that. But some of the things in place now, particularly the speculative limits and also the scale down of the hedgers uh, in the deliveries months. And, you know, we make a mistake when we think that the, the problems of this kind are only with speculators because you know, oftentimes the real problem, the biggest problem is within some of the large hedgers. But our computer capabilities are catching up more all the time. You'd be amazed at the ability with our audit trails to go back and look and, and reconstruct exactly what happened, plus our ability to aggregate those people that ought to be aggregated. For instance, if you and I and Walt, for instance, are at times where we're trading in consort or we have joint ventures together, then, you know, for, for purposes of this rule, for, for uh, uh, speculative position limits, they should aggregate our positions. So I'm telling you that it's a lot better than it was back then. One other thing on income tax, it makes a difference whether you speculate or hedge. Now, whose word are they going to take? You, that's your word. When you, when you, uh, when you uh, buy that contract, you have to say, you know, that, that I am a hedge. You have to apply for a hedger exemption if you are a hedger. And then the mercantile decides, you know, whether that's a, a justifiable hedge position or not. Then our surveillance people in Chicago came along and took, come along and take a look at it, and often it comes clear to us to say, hey, is this a legitimate hedge position or is it not? And that's, you know, and, and you know that's, that's a tough one at times. At times, it's a matter of weighing the evidence. I don't want to take all your time, but uh, well, okay, how about all these people using the new democratic? I mean, that didn't work against the, uh, the farmer. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, th that gets into the argument of the market liquidity and the speculators and the whole thing. And, you know, if we start on that, they haven't solved, they haven't, nobody's really won that argument in 130 years. Again, I'd like to say that we're not, we as an organization, and Frank and I, re representing the two departments, we are not working with futures. We are not representing you as a producer and we sell your commodity. It's a direct sale with a buyer, not in a speculative venture. You, as a producer, and in my opinion, in your IRS, would declare it simply as a sales transaction because that's exactly what it is. It is not in any way tied onto on any of the documentation as a mercantile or a board of trade transaction. Uh, yes. No, quite simply, you know, the futures market is a price neutral market. Now that was hard for me to accept because I too am a producer, you know, I only want markets to go up. But it's a price neutral market, it has to be because there's people on both sides of that market. It's not the, and, and when you really think about it, it's a good thing that it's that way that it has, you know, it's not, uh, it's not dictated one side or the other or pretty soon you wouldn't really have a market. But the, the option is only another tool of that kind of a price-neutral market. Uh, does that answer your question? Well, ladies, here we have one. I'll, I'll take, a, if there's a couple more, including you, uh, I have him right here, and then we'll cut this off. Go ahead. The question is on the Board of Trade, why don't the Commission look into regulating the amount of trades made so it would coincide with the USDA's crop reports? In other words, how can they trade more beans than are produced? To adequately 
to adequately answer that question, we'd have to go in a long uh, discussion of the, of you know what what a futures market is and what makes it work. But quite simply, the economists, I think almost to a man, will tell you that given those kinds of restraints, a futures market will fold. You know, it just won't will not work. It has to have the liquidity of the traders. You know, and that's not that's not unique to the futures market. Surprisingly. We have that in the cash market, too. Now, I want to sell wheat. Do the millers want to buy wheat every day? No, they don't. Now, how do I sell wheat if we didn't have a futures market? How would I sell wheat on those days when the miller doesn't want to buy wheat? I'll bet you there'd be a speculator there willing to bid something on that wheat. And in fact, they do it all the time. You go to a livestock sale. Maybe there's nobody there who wants that feeder steer. But there's somebody there that'll buy it. And, and on the other hand, his comment was, in both cases, though, the actual commodity existed. I'm sure that this is a problem, and it's something that is may need to be explained at a time when time would permit. I know it's a question in my mind. I do not mean to make light of that question. Well, that is a serious question, and the, and the, the, the position of the, of the speculators, the, the percentage of speculators and hedgers in a market is something that we watch all the time. We need them both. We need them in the right uh, percentages, and this is one of the things in, that in the cattle market, you know, I wish we had more hedgers on the long side. I think that's one thing that we're short of in the cattle market. Or we're short of longs, both speculators and hedgers, really. We had one more question, the gentleman right here. Frank, can you uh, feel that uh, he's referring to that uh, the bean man in Missouri where he, he, he's referring, can something be done to protect people? Again, that guy losing all of his product in that bean deal in Missouri when it went into that bankrupt elevator. Well, as near as I can answer that, uh, that particular situation had nothing to do uh, with uh, the rules of hedging or whatever. Uh, what that uh, uh, situation was, and we have had others like them, where uh, the, I think it's safe to say that the owner of the business uh, took some risks and used your warehouse receipted or scale ticket grain uh, illegally. Uh, instead of having that grain in the house, he probably moved, out, moved it out and so on. Um, it's just like every other type of business that's managed, not managed properly, but then when it finally got to where he went into Chapter 11 or went broke, uh, everything in the, in his, on his property was seized, and uh, I don't know whether the Commodity Futures Trading Commission could have done anything that about that or not. That's uh, just a regular bankruptcy law that took in, it took uh, over at that point in time, and that's the way it is. Now, some of our some growers uh, in some of these Chapter 11 uh, uh, situations that had uh, forward contracts that had not delivered yet, and I I farm not too far from neighbors that were involved in the coast trading uh, chapter 11 that I mentioned out west. These farmers uh, that had 20,000, 5,000 or whatever 
bushels of wheat contracted for like maybe um, two months down the road, 60 day later delivery. At the time when that chapter 11 was called, those contracts were assets of that company that was in, in question and those people had to deliver that grain knowing that they might get 30 cents on the dollar or less. And that's again a bankruptcy, that's a law that has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I know that the questions are many, and I know that this whole era that I've referred to will develop more questions, and they will be answered. But for the purposes of this meeting, we felt it was important to give you our viewpoint, at least on price protection, our viewpoint on a method that will guarantee cost of production and a reasonable profit. So with that, I want to thank you. Frank and I definitely appreciate your coming, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you.